From now on, everyone is a debtor, as there is no way to pay for anything under the constitutional requirements. You can't pay in gold, and since gold constitutionally is the only thing that's accepted as legal tender for payment of debts, you can now never own anything. I mean, how are you going to own something? You're going to buy a car, and if you're not paying in gold, how do you own it? You're paying with paper money that has no value. You're paying with Federal Reserve notes, and a note is a promissory note. And a promissory note means it's a promise to pay, but when? When are you going to get paid? You got a Federal Reserve note for $20. When am I going to actually get $20? Never. Because there is no gold and silver that can ever be exchanged for that note. So therefore, from, from 1933 on, everyone became a debtor and owned nothing. Or at least this is the line that the government would like you to believe. The Constitution only allows gold and silver as legal tender. The states are immediately defunct as they can't pay their employees in legal tender and they become corporations under the umbrella of USA Incorporated. In fact, there is no separation now between the USA Incorporated, the corporation, and the state, the corporation, or the city, the corporation, or the county, the corporation. They're all corporations that are sub-corporations of the other corporation, with the Papa Corporation being USA Incorporated. All capital names signifies a corporate entity. Ever notice how the statements that come from the government addressed to you are in all capital letters? Are you are the sovereign fl flesh and blood man and woman, have a corresponding corporation attached to you. It's called a straw man. John Henry Doe in capital letters instead of John Henry Doe in upper and lower case letters. Your social security number, your driver's license, your marriage license, any license, bank account, utility bills, etc. all have your straw man name on them. In 1933, Roosevelt started social security and everyone became collateral to the USA Incorporated. We are human resources. The government was broke, bankrupt, and needed to be able to borrow. Our birth certificate became a registration. And if you'll notice, on if you get a copy of your birth certificate, it's on bond paper. It's a bond. They've created a bond and they've assigned a value to it. The cunning lawyers found the loophole in the Constitution that allowed them to make slaves of sovereigns. Under the Constitution, there is no restriction on entering into contracts. And it is through these contracts we give up our sovereignty. If you sign an agreement at work that your boss can come into your home and inspect your computer, that agreement is more powerful than your Fourth Amendment general right to privacy in your personal effects at home. You are presumed to know you gave away a specific right when signing the agreement. Okay, now let's study the lawful elements of a contract. One, there has to be a meeting of the minds, or another term for this would be full disclosure. Bob is washing his 2007 Cadillac out front and tells Jim he needs money and will sell him his car for $4,000. Jim happily gives him the $4,000 and Bob walks him around back to the back of his house and hands him the keys to his old Toyota. There is no, quote, meeting of the minds or full disclosure, so the contract is void. Two. There has to be consideration exchanged by both parties. Consideration is something of value. Something of value needs to be exchanged, and that can be, quote, a promise to pay. I mean, that has value. Or giving up a right or something else. Both sides, number three, both sides must sign a wet ink signature, as that is the evidence of commercial liability that you can be sued for, for each party. There has to be offer and acceptance. How would you indicate offer and acceptance in a situation where one side signs and the other side doesn't? How do you know if the other side accepted? In a verbal contract, then both sides would be verbal. But in a written contract where one person signs, then there's no evidence that the other person accepted it if they're not going to put their signature to it. 
If only one party signs, it's a unilateral contract and the signing party can revoke it at any time. Speaking, you can revoke the signature anytime you wish as long as you're not running out on the contract. However, if the promise to give you the consideration was based on fraud, then you can rescind your contract. Most contracts are unilateral. I mean, if you sign up for a credit card that you're applying for to somebody and your signature's on it, but they're unilateral because you're the only one signing. Home loan, you're the only one signing. The bank never signs. Car loan, does the lending agency sign? You're the only signatory to the contract. So that's unilateral, uni, one, unilateral. You declare what you will do in exchange for something. Why can't you rescind your, your signature? Let's look at the government contracts and see if they fit the above requirements. How about a marriage license? Did the government tell you that when you submitted submission, the application, Black's Law defines this as to beg for a license, a license is something you obtain that allows you to do something that otherwise would be illegal. That you are giving all authority over your union to the state. From now on, the state's going to tell you whether you can get a divorce or not, right? One of the things the state gains is the product of the result of your union. What could that be? How about your children? The reason Child Protective Services can take your property which is your children, without a court appearance due process under the 5th and 14th Amendment, wherein you can defend your rights and property, is because they claim it is their property. They are taking. For thousands of years, people have gotten married, and all it took was a vow in front of God with your preacher. And the fact that everybody in the community accepted you as living together as man and wife, and you were hitched. What on earth does anyone gain by getting a certificate, which implies the title has transferred, that's the meaning of certificate, from the state? Next, a driver's license. Did you know that there is no requirement to have a license to travel in your car with your guests on the public highways and roadways? There isn't. However, you will need a DMV license to drive a motor vehicle with passengers on the roads. Passengers are those who pay to be ferried about. Think trains, planes, and ships. These all have passengers who pay to be taken wherever. And do the passengers ride for free? Nope, they have to pay. Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce. Commerce is being paid, business. And so if you are engaged in commerce for hire, you need a license to drive. Case number one, quote, these are uh, court cases. The use of the highway for the purpose of travel and transportation is not a mere privilege but a common fundamental right. Now remember we discussed the difference between rights and privileges. Of which the public and individuals cannot rightfully be deprived, quote. Chicago Motor Coach versus Chicago, 169 Northeast 221. Case number two. The right of the citizen to travel upon the public highways and to transport his property thereon, either by carriage or by automobile, is not a mere privilege which a city may prohibit or permit at will, but a common law right which he has under the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thompson versus Smith. Case number three, quote, the right to travel is a part of the liberty of which the citizen cannot be deprived without due process of law under the Fifth Amendment. Kent versus Dulles, 357 U.S. 116. Now that is a Supreme Court decision. Case number four, the right to travel is a well-established common right that does not owe its existence to the federal government. It is recognized by the courts as a natural right, quote, Schachtman v. Dulles, 96, Appellate Court, D.C. 287, quote, The claim and exercise of a constitutional right cannot be converted into a crime. Vill Miller v. U.S., 230 F. 482nd. So anyway, now we can see that there's a lot of abuses of power that the government has established 